We're here to talk about two cases. So I'm Michael Carroll. I'm a faculty co-director of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. Thank you all for joining us. We are joined for our panelists' sake uh, by members of my cyber law class. There was a lot of discussion of Section 230 today, which we have studied. And Justice Gorsuch has an understanding of that law that we find troubling. <laughs> um, uh, OK. Um, so the, we have a Florida law and a Texas law. The Florida law is the more complicated one. Um, and it has uh, the following. Uh, it has some general requirements and then some exceptions. So the goal of the law, the, pur the, the purported goal of the law is to uh, make sure that speakers are treated equally and not discriminated based on their, uh, the way they speak, what they say or their viewpoint, depending on which state you're in. So in Florida, there's a consistency requirement that websites or, or the covered entities, which uh, have 100 million users or, or uh, have X dollars in revenue, uh, a social media platform must, quote, apply censorship, deplatforming, and shadow banning standards in a consistent manner among its users. So you're allowed to do those things, you just have to be consistent about it. And to avoid switching up your, your rules too quickly, you have to change, uh, you can't change those rules uh, any more than 30 days at a time. So there's essentially a 30 day wait period before you change your deplatforming, censoring, uh, or uh, shadow banning standards. Um, when you take it down under the Florida law, individuals are required to get notice in writing within seven days, um, and it, it will explain why the action was taken uh, with a thorough rationale. Um, and then users are allowed to opt out of having uh, a, a, the, the post prioritization and shadow banning, so not exactly aligned with uh, those other activities. Um, and then there are three exceptions. So generally, there's this sort of overall, you can do this platforms as long as you're consistent, don't change your rules every 30 days, give users an opt out um, and give individual notice. But in the case of political candidates, you may not deplatform, de period. Posts of buyer about political candidates, you may not take down, period. Uh, and journalistic enterprises, uh, may not take any action to censor, deplatform, or shadow ban such an enterprise. Got it? <laughs> um, now, some of those details seem to matter in the argument, and some did not. Um, the Texas law is a little more uh, a little more succinct, and, and really there are just two major provisions that are under review. Uh, a prohibition of viewpoint discrimination. So social media platform is uh, prohibited from censoring a user uh, or a user's ability to receive the expression of someone else based on viewpoint of the user or the other person, a viewpoint represented in the expression, or a user's geographic location in this state or any part of this state. And then again, there's a notice provision that you have to, uh, you have to notify the user when content has been taken down um, and explain the reason. And then there's a complaint mechanism, uh, and then you can appeal from that. We don't have to go into those details. And then for enforcement, both laws permit uh, a private right of action. Um, the Florida law can subject the, the platform that's non-compliant up to $100,000 in fines. Um, in Texas, the attorney general is entitled to attorney's fees and the cost of investigation. And in addition, courts can uh, 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 impose daily penalties for non-compliance. So that's it in a nutshell. But the major sort of things we're going to hear about more are the First Amendment um, and whether, uh, whether, in fact, these platforms are engaged in speech of their own or are they merely there to carry the speech of others, that's the sort of uh, essential disagreement. Um, and then there's sort of an intermediate point where they might be a shopping mall. I thought we'd hear more about shopping malls, but your sort of precedents are, are they newspaper shopping malls or the telephone company? I thought that's what we were going to hear about at Argument. That's what's in the briefing. But that was not at all the focus of the argument today. All right, with that, I'm going to switch gears so that I can let our speaker take the uh, place of prominence, uh, and I will introduce them. Check, check. This is on. Can you hear you anyway? Can you? I, I don't know if. Not 
That's all. All right. This this is not. Okay, I'm going to borrow that. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Um, to my left is Corbin Barthold. He's from Tech Freedom, he, and they supported. An, uh, now we have an imbalanced panel here. We usually strike for balance, and we did invite members of, uh, representing both Texas and Florida and the Amiki, Amiki who filed on their behalf. We did have one of those who was going to join us and then dropped out this morning. Uh, the other Amiki are not in DC and were not available. Uh, and so we ended up with an imbalanced panel. Um, in, to try to balance it out a bit, we've asked my uh, distinguished colleague, Steve Wormiel, to uh, give us the state's arguments um, in, their, uh, in their briefs, and then he will switch gears and be more of a general court observer when we talk about the argument. To my immediate left is Corbin Bartol, Tech Freedom, amicus brief in support of Net Choice and CCIA. He's Internet Policy Council and Director of Appellate Litigation uh, at the think tank that involves technology, law, and policy. Uh, uh, and then next to him is Rupa Bhattacharya, did I say that right? Good. Uh, Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection at Georgetown University, um, at Georgetown Law School. Uh, before that, she was at the Department of Justice for nearly 20 years, uh, and she's, uh, she served as the head of the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund, uh, among other activities, which distributed over $8 billion uh, uh, to victims. Next um, is, let's see, is that Scott, right? Yes, All right. Uh, so next is Scott Wilkins. He's a senior counsel at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University, where he focuses primarily on freedom of speech online and government regulation of social media platforms, of all things. Um, and he spent uh, 10 years prior to that at the law firm of Gen uh, Jenner and Block, uh, working on copyright infringement and suing internet platforms. That, um, and then next... Who's next? Uh, Emily. Uh, next is Emily, who's uh, with the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of Freedom of the Press, um, and she is the Technology and Press Freedom Project Fellow at the Reporters Committee, um, and uh, is a graduate of the University of Virginia Law School, where she was a member of the First Amendment uh, Clinic. So uh, relevant experience there. Next is Ari. Uh, Ari Holtzblatt is at Wilmer Hale. He's a partner and his practice focuses on appellate and government and public policy litigation. He has extensive experience representing leading technology innovators and media companies from trial courts to the Supreme Court um, and including on issues such as the Communications Decency Act. So I suspect Ari has something to say about Section 230 as well. Next to him is uh, Catherine Gellis. Um, who filed an amicus brief on, on behalf of Blue Sky, Chris Riley, and the Copia Institute. Um, and she is, uh, she's, she's got her own practice. She uh, focuses on intellectual property, free speech, internet, uh, intermedia, intermediary liability, privacy, and other innovation policy matters affecting technology use and development. Um, and then finally, we have Steve Wormiel. Uh, who has been a professor of law here for how many years, Steve? 25. 25 years. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> he teaches our First Amendment, uh, our First Amendment class, um, and uh, has graciously given up four hours, four hours of his time to listen to arguments to help us uh, sort of figure out uh, what happened here. And I'm actually going to start with him since um, the, let's hear sort of what the state's argument was in support of their the lawfulness of their uh, laws, and then we'll uh, sort of shift gears to hear from the net choice, uh, Amiki, uh, and then Scott uh, filed on behalf of neither party, so we'll let him go last to sort of give us the intermediate position that his brief took. So Steve, take it away. So thank you, Michael. Glad to be here and, and glad to be with everybody else. I think my most profound thought of the day, which has absolutely nothing to do with anything else, is one word to the Chief Justice, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, the argument was absurdly long. Um, the, those of you that got to listen, the morning argument was supposed to take an hour and was two hours and 40 minutes. And it would have been a great time to break for lunch and give everybody a break. I 
was not in the courtroom, but Justice Sotomayor, as we know, is a diabetic. I wonder how she was feeling on the bench uh, after two hours and 40 minutes. Anyway, I'll, I'll turn to the substance. Um, I am not a state lawyer. I am not, I have no connection to Florida or Texas. I do not desire to play them on television, um, but I will do my best to talk about what their views were. Um, Florida was represented by the Solicitor General Henry Whitaker, representing Attorney General Ashley Moody, and Texas by Solicitor General um, Aaron Nielsen, representing Attorney General Ken Paxton. The common th there were a number of common themes, although as, as Michael described, there are differences in the laws, there were a number of common themes in the two arguments. Um, most predominantly, and, and Michael, I guess you said you didn't hear that much about this, but, but I think that they still stuck to this key point, which is they view the um, platforms as common carriers and therefore subject to regulation like the phone company. There were a lot of historical references going back to the creation of the telegraph and the telegraph as a common carrier and how we didn't allow the telegraph and we don't now allow the phone companies to discriminate on the basis of content. And so they wanted to treat um, the, the internet platforms as common carriers. They made a number of different assertions um, Florida may be more, more obviously than Texas. Florida Attorney General's office argued um, that the platforms are not engaging in editorial content. Much of the, of the argument focused on analogies. Are we talking about newspapers? Are we talking about common carriers? What, you know, what is the nature of the beast that we're trying to regulate? And um, Florida was very adamant in saying these are not editorial judgments like newspapers. They differ significantly in that respect. And that was part of the argument to then bolster why they could be seen as common carriers. Um, but both states tried to justify the need for their laws as um, uh, trying to prevent private entities from engaging in censorship, that the major social media platforms, Facebook, YouTube, uh, X, engage in censorship and shouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, and that led to, a, I'm sure other speakers will talk about the back and forth between Paul Clement and the state lawyers about when something is censorship and when something is content control um, and what the difference is between the two. Um, but the overarching point, uh, I think, was this notion, which they had raised in their briefs, um, that the platforms should be treated as common carriers and therefore subject to government regulation. Um, I guess one of the most dramatic versions of that argument was um, by the Texas Solicitor General Nielsen, who said if states can't regulate businesses, then we're in Lochner 2.0, a reference to the Lochner era in the early 1900s when the Supreme Court struck down a couple of hundred state laws as interfering um, with the freedom of businesses to do their business. Um, that was kind of a dramatic analogy. Um, I don't think it resonated all that well with the court, but. Um, uh, an interesting moment. They were tired by that point anyway. Yeah. Um, just a couple of the, uh, again, I'm sure other speakers will talk about this, a couple of the points of debate which began with questioning of the state lawyers. Um, one is why was this a facial challenge? Um, that seemed very troubling to the justices and, and may ultimately kind of confound what they decide to do. A second point, which I'm sure people will address, is if it is a facial challenge, what's the proper standard for analyzing a facial challenge? Um, I've been teaching First Amendment for a long time, and I was only aware of one standard called the Salerno standard, but the lawyers talked at great length about another one, the sweep of the law, the legitimate 
sweep of the law. Um, you know, I may be missing something in my class. I'll have to go look that up and make sure I'm not uh, omitting something I should be teaching. Um, and then um, what, what's the proper next step? Uh, there was a lot of discussion of remand. Um, and then a question of, well, if you remand, what are you remanding for? If it's a, there was criticism that there's not a fully developed record in either of the two cases. That's true to a large degree because it's a facial challenge. And if you remand to develop a more elaborate record or detailed record, why are you doing that if it's still a facial challenge? It doesn't cease to be a facial challenge just because the justices would like to have more facts. Um, so maybe I'll stop there, Michael, and I'll chime back in a little later. Okay, great. Um, oops, sorry, I'm going to borrow this again. Um, great. And I think um, to the panelists, our original plan had been to sort of do one round talking about what your positions were in the briefs, and then we'd do a second round. But I don't think that's, given the way the argument went and the issues the justices focused on, I, I want to turn you loose and make go ahead and start uh, injecting your, your views about the argument because uh, so just for the, especially if students haven't had the First Amendment, this Salerno standard is, a facial challenge means that you're saying the law is unconstitutional in all of its applications. There is no single application in which it would be constitutional. So for the states to win under that standard, they just have to be able to point to uh, at least one application that would be constitutional and the facial challenge fails. Um, which is why Mr. Clement was taking a different, arguing that there's a different standard when it's a First Amendment case, and I'm interested in our panelists' views about that question. Um, the other thing that you might hear about is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which is a federal law that uh, protects social media platforms or interactive computer services from removing content from their services uh, if it meets certain uh, criteria. Um, and the Florida law recognizes this and says the law is not intended to do uh, to reach anything that would be preempted by Section 230. Um, and that got a fair amount of attention from the justices. So anyway, that's the context for that. So I'm going to just walk down the line, except we're going to hop over Scott, and then he's going to go uh, last. So Corbin, take us away. Uh, that puts me in a... <clears throat> Interesting position because during the oral argument, the justices went in some unexpected directions while the states argued exactly what I would expect them to. So they leaned heavily on common carrier law. That is what our brief was about. And also, I live tweeted the entire argument. So I'm too tired to improvise. Um, <laughs> so I will quickly run through our, our brief as it applies to what was said. Um, the common carrier rule. Uh, it goes way, way back. In the Fifth Circuit, the lower decision out of Texas, uh, Judge Oldham seemed very proud to trace it back to like the 15th century, which I don't entirely get the like old is good thing. I'm not really interested in what like Henry VI's judges did when they tackled like law and <laughs> economics, but there you have it. Um, it is very grounded in uh, carrying stuff, which its name kind of suggests. Um, the classic example, of course, is railroads having to take customers on like terms and not discriminating. Um, it is true that it was expanded modestly to something, you know, like telegrams and the telephone. Uh, really, these are better thought of as sort of widgets of information. If I talk to you privately on the telephone, nobody knows what we've talked about. Uh, that leaves the phone company in a very good position to just serve everybody because they're not going to catch heat for, you know, what's going on on the phone. Um, extraordinarily different from the many-to-many -many communication that social media engenders. Um, and it was a good day for us in the sense that that seemed to be the view among the justices. Um, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, at one point, um, Texas was trying to say, you know, that the telegraph is not dumb pipes. And Chief Justice Roberts says, you're completely begging the question because you're already assuming that there's some kind of analogy between a telegraph and Twitter. 
Um, Justice Sotomayor understood that even if you go back to common carrier law, like common carriers could boot obnoxious customers. Like if a customer on a train were going up and saying to patrons the stuff that like gets you booted off of Twitter, they would get booted off the train. Um, and it's just kind of a non sequitur. Um, there's, there's a big question of what does the common carrier doctrine even do in a First Amendment case? Why would it short circuit the First Amendment? You basically, it's, it's a common law thing, right? So if you're extending it, Texas said, you know, well, it's all about tradition. Well, there's no tradition with social media. It's existed for like 20 years, right? Uh, so that takes a common law ruling from a judge saying, you know, I'm going to break new ground here. Where's the authority for that judge to curtail the First Amendment based on this common law doctrine? There's all kinds of problems like this. At the end of the day, it's kind of like an epicycle because the real debate is, are social media platforms expressive or not? And if you succeed in showing they're not expressive, you don't really need common carrier doctrine. You're, you're, you're done. You, you did it. Um, and so one of the most interesting things about the argument from the, from the perspective of this argument is even Justice Thomas, who's the one justice who had written on the court before about um, how this might be a really good idea to declare social media uh, common carriers, he didn't defend the doctrine. Like if you go back and go through the transcript, all of the defense of it is from counsel for uh, Texas and Florida. It just got no purchase with the justices um, at one point. Florida raised it and Justice Barrett immediately said, oh, okay, we'll put that aside and then answer my question. Um, so I will stop there because we have a lot more, more people to go. Great. Um, so Rupa. Great. So uh, yes, thank you. So I, I don't know if this was clear, but we also filed on behalf of... Can you see a green light? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. We, we also filed on behalf of neither party, so I don't know if you want oh. to skip me and move on. But um, <laughs> Yeah, why don't we do that then? Let's hear from the net choice for folks first. Um, so, Emily, go ahead. Sure. This mic is on. Test, test. Okay, there we go. Um, well, thank you so much, Michael, for uh, for uh, being the moderator. And I am, I am, unlike my esteemed colleagues, have not as many years of experience practicing uh, First Amendment law and I'm much closer in the position of the students in this room. Um, but I am a fellow at the Reporters Committee and we worked on a brief with the ACLU uh, on behalf of ourselves and a number of uh, media organizations in support of Net Choice. Um, and our brief focused primarily on the protection that a uh, case from I think it was the 1970s in uh, Miami Herald versus Tornillo provided for editorial discretion. Um, and our understanding of that, uh, the, the, that case's application to um, the circumstances here uh, is basically that the, the functions that the newspaper is exercising in determining that uh, piece of content, that a uh, right of reply statute in the, in the case of the um, Miami Herald versus Tornillo case, that a statute like that, which is requiring that a newspaper host a particular piece of content, um, is analogous in terms of the function that it's requiring uh, a private entity to exercise as the statutes at issue in this case, um, because the, the function ultimately is, a, is an expressive one and requiring uh, the hosting of speech and of, of is, is a sort of curtailing the expressive conduct of um, social media platforms. So that was sort of the thrust of our argument. And we also focused in our um, brief on the disclosure mandate provisions, which got almost no play at argument today. Um, but we, we argued that there's sort of more of an indirect uh, editorial discretion um, or argument there, um, basically because sort of exacting attacks on explanation um, and it required the platforms to to explain um, if they were to take something down why they did so um, the, the the each statute does this in a slightly different way um, but uh, we we thought that sort of per the, per the Miami Herald versus Tornillo precedent that that um, that also violated the First Amendment um, in terms of the the argument itself, I think the, the editorial discretion uh, line of cases got a lot of attention from the justices. And 
they seemed very, uh, very interested in the sort of terminology um, that that various parties were using. And the lawyer for for Net Choice, Paul Clement, referred to um, referred to content moderation and editorial discretion as being essentially the same thing. Um, Justices Thomas and I think Alito were very skeptical of this framing and said, basically, why isn't editorial disc- isn't content moderation just censorship um, and and sort of and the states attempted to distinguish between censorship um, content moderation and organization all of these terminologies to me um, seemed seem to be getting at the the same function and that function is an expressive one and that function is one that is protected by the reasoning in the tornillo case um, so it was, a, it was a very interesting way of teeing up the editorial discretion conversation, I thought. Um, but I think the the sort of semantic question about what what is what is this action and why does it seem like it's all of these other things to me illustrated really well that um, that the action is one that can't not be labeled as an expressive one. Um, and I thought that was a, a very interesting sort of way of talking about this editorial discretion issue. So I'll, be, I'll leave it there. Great. So all right, go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? You can hear me without this. So, um, uh, so uh, thank you for having me uh, on this panel. Uh, just to briefly orient myself, I uh, am a partner at Wilmer Hale. I represented, in this case, the developers uh, Alliance and other um, uh, 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 sort of software developer uh, organizations, uh, and we filed a brief in this case to make uh, what is frankly a, a sort of narrow point within the context of the many issues in the case, which is that uh, if a platform or or a, or a social media company is using algorithms. Uh, to engage in content moderation, that the fact that you may use code uh, to carry out your expressive judgments uh, doesn't suddenly make those judgments non-expressive. Uh, and there's really sort of two core points that we made uh, in presenting that argument. One is that, you know, who, who writes code? It's human beings. Uh, so the code doesn't just pop out of the ether and the human beings that are writing that code are implementing uh, expressive judgments that the platforms want to make. In fact, code is necessary, like algorithms are fundamentally necessary if you are trying to organize the content of uh, billions of users who are posting on the platforms all of the time. And even if they were not, and actually this came up in our brief and it came up for a brief second at argument, uh, well, it's the, the natural question these days is, well, what about AI? Well, what about artificial intelligence? You say human beings are behind uh, the code. Well, what if the we think that maybe human beings aren't behind the code because you've developed these artificial intelligences that seem to be removed. Now, there's, I think, two basic responses that we address in that, in that, uh, and that were addressed at argument. The first is uh, that, that still, at some point, there is a human being behind uh, even these artificial intelligences, that the, the, the design of the artificial intelligence algorithm is being designed by, by uh, very uh, sophisticated engineers and, and, and in, in, in conversation with those very sophisticated engineers by, by policy makers within each of these companies who are deciding what should be the, the expressive judgments that should be expressed uh, through that artificial intelligence. But, but uh, even more fundamentally, uh, the, the point of, uh, of this software, of, of these algorithms, is still to communicate something that is expressive. And, and fundamentally, that is the communication of the companies uh, that are, are operating these these platforms. Uh, so this, uh, now why did this come up? This came up because, uh, as you've heard, I think across the panel, uh, in, in, a, in, in really all cases at the Supreme Court, but especially First Amendment uh, cases, everyone is, is reaching, grasping for analogies. They're trying to think, reason through analogy to how to think about this problem. So on one hand, you had uh, the, the classic cases of, uh, of a newspaper, Everyone agrees a newspaper is expressive when it's exercising editorial judgment about what stories to print or what letters to the editor to include in the newspaper or a bookstore. Uh, everyone agrees that even though it's the authors who are engaged in the primary expression, the bookstore is also engaged in expression by deciding what bookstores, what books to carry. There's a uh, huge difference between a children's bookstore and 
a Marxist bookstore, and that is uh, conveyed by the, the books that you choose to carry uh, within uh, the bookstore. And so on the one hand is this, our social media platforms like bookstores, like newspapers, like parade uh, organizers, uh, or as the states would argue, are they more like uh, Western Union uh, or the telephone company? Uh, and, and I do think, although the, the argument was not organized around uh, common carriage, uh, that the reliance on, on Western Union and the sort of point of Western Union was an attempt to, to, to locate this case within the instincts that, that many have, which is that you can regulate uh, the, trans, the discrimination that, uh, that, that may happen uh, within a company like a Western Union, uh, but you can't uh, if, you're, if you're trying to regulate a bookstore. And so the, 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 the algorithms issue came up in the, in the context of the court grappling with and the parties grappling uh, with what analogy do we do we stick these 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 companies in and 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 I think the the honest answer and, and this came up in argument is that you know this is a new question uh, but it's a new question that uh, we can still uh, uh, connect uh, to to some of these other examples and, and this will be the last thought I share before uh, handing it off uh, which is that uh, I think the 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 real pivot point within the argument, as I see it, uh, comes down to, to, to two sides of this analogy problem that we're coming I, I actually don't know that there's any support or nearly any support on the court, certainly not a majority support on the court, for the idea that the classic social media platform, when it engages in classic content moderation, isn't expressive and isn't entitled to First Amendment protection that causes really a fundamental problem uh, for these laws. Uh, and, and there was basically no defense of that question at, at argument. Uh, and I think that's because when, a, when, a, uh, when, when Facebook is deciding what to put, it, what to allow in your news feed uh, and what to exclude from your news feed, uh, that is expressive and it's really hard to argue otherwise. Uh, and so the states basically didn't try. Um, and, and that's because it looks a lot like the decision, for example, of a, of a bookstore about what books to put at the front of the bookstore or to include in the bookstore at all or not include in, in, in the bookstore. Uh, instead, uh, a lot of the argument uh, was focused on questions about, well, what about email? What about direct messaging? Um, uh, wh what about uh, uh, online marketplaces? Uh, or what about Uber? You know, if these laws apply to those companies and those companies are making uh, judgments about who to allow uh, within their uh, within their services or not, is that expressive in the same way? And that was an attempt to reach out and, and analogize the platforms to Western Union, to to things that everyone I think is is comfortable regulating. And and this is coming up. We talked about facial challenges versus as applied. This is coming up because uh, uh, the, the this is a facial challenge. And so uh, you know whatever verbal formulation you use about a facial challenge, uh, if you can identify a significant number of examples where the law is constitutional, uh, then it's hard, you, you probably can't prevail on, on, on a facial challenge. And so the challengers to the law and their allies on the bench uh, were trying to, to identify examples where the law could be constitutionally applied. Uh, and, 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 and they thought perhaps uh, email uh, or direct messaging uh, it may be examples uh, where this where this could be constitutionally applied. Now, I, I, this is my last thought. I'm sorry for going maybe a little long, um, but I do think the 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 a number of the justices and and I'm as, as someone who represents many of these companies, I'm certainly sympathetic uh, to this view. I think a number of the justices were very concerned that even if they weren't ready to say that this law was unconstitutional in all of these instances that we're talking about, are you going to allow a law where there's a $100,000 fine in the case of Florida uh, for violations of this law to take effect, uh, where there is a, a part of the law, the, the, the part of the law that was the subject, man, the focus of all the litigation up to this point, uh, are you going to allow, and everyone seems to agree that the law is unconstitutional, on, with those applications, which was really what everyone had been arguing about up to this point, and 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 we think that this is going to have an enormously chilling effect on that portion of the of of of, of the uh, economy uh, where this law would take effect. Are you going to allow this law to take effect as to that part of the of the landscape, even if you have some uncertainty about other parts of the landscape? And I think that question 
uh, is where the rubber is going to meet the road on how this case is going to come out uh, by, the, by the end of the term. Great. Kathy, go ahead. Yeah. This was four hours of oral argument to obfuscate what really should be a very simple point. That um, the question really before the court is, do platforms have a First Amendment right to decide whether and how they intermediate other people's expression. And this got conflated in the court's mind in a couple of ways. And some make a little bit more sense, and some are thanks to obfuscating briefing, I think, by the states. Um, one concern was relating to Section 230, because they had this idea that there's a cake and eat it too um, problem with claiming that uh, the First Amendment is you claiming the speech and Section 230 is you disclaiming the speech. Because Section 230, one major facet of it is you're not liable for how other people use your systems to express themselves. And so they're like, okay, you've got this really nice statute that says other people's speech is not yours. But now aren't you saying with the First Amendment and you've got rights here, oh, but actually it is your speech, and therefore you have First Amendment rights over it. And I think that's not applicable because it's really two sets of speech. There's two sets of speech going on. You have whatever the users are saying themselves, and then you also have something that the platforms are saying overarching it. So, for instance, um, this may not be the greatest analogy, but I was tired and it was the one that occurred to me, so we'll go with it. Um, if you're a platform that wants to host conversation about cooks and that they post their recipes and conversations about cooking, you're saying as you allow cooks to post their recipes and their conversations about cooking, we like to be associated with conversations about cooking and cooks. Um, the thing that a cook specifically says is their own messaging. And, you know, you hope that the conversation is fine. But if somebody posts a recipe for a cake that includes arsenic, there's a problem with that expression. But that problem with the expression was imbued by the person who spoke it. And Section 230 operates in large part, but there's another part to it, but in large part to say, well, the platform is not responsible. That was not their speech. The arsenic recipe is belongs to another user and the platform is not responsible. But the platform is responsible for basically saying to the world, we like conversations about cooking. And depending on how they treat, you know, the arsenic recipes, maybe also how they feel about, you know, food hygiene. Um, if they leave too many arsenic recipes up, we can judge them for that's their attitude towards the world and that's what they're conveying to the world as they use their moderation policies. I am not entirely sure that this was prop was adequately communicated to the court. Uh, Paul Clement did make some noble efforts at trying to sort of explain that these two ideas of the First Amendment and the statute are not in tension with each other, but there was such um, misunderstanding that it's unclear whether he overcame that. Then we also had things about the procedural posture of this case, that this was, we have an injunction, because basically Net Choice showed up and said in both of these cases, hang on a second, the platforms have a First Amendment right in how they moderate their platforms, and both of these laws just target that. And so we've got one issue and one issue only, which is that the platforms have a First Amendment right, which the courts need to recognize. And at least in Florida, the courts were recognizing that. In the case of Texas, the court was not recognizing that so well. Um, but if you, the thing before the Supreme Court was rather internet platforms really need to be treated more like the newspapers because what they do with the sorts of choices they make are more similar to those of the newspaper than any of the cases where we have found exceptions and taken away that discretion. But the justices were kind of cynical about like your best cases were like Prune Yard where the shopping center had to be open to all pamphleteers, but not necessarily based on what they were saying. Um, and then there was the uh, Fair v. Rumsfeld case, which was the law schools had to let uh, military recruitments on campus, even though they didn't like don't ask, don't tell. But even then, the justices were like, but that was predicated on the fact that you were taking the government's money, so maybe the government 
on that basis, that was the basis why you lost your the discretion you otherwise would have had. So I think the courts are getting there, but then there was the case of, what does it mean if it's a facial challenge? What does it mean that it's on an injunction? So I think how this case goes uh, will really depend on how they tease out those issues, because I do think there was a recognition by the court that the, at least by most of the justices, although not necessarily all of the justices, that hang on a second, there has to be a First Amendment right manifest in the platforms, because otherwise we can see the chilling effects of what will happen. Um, and just to go back to the uh, what brought me here, um, I wrote an amicus brief on behalf of three parties. Um, one is the Copi Institute, which is a think tank, but the think tank is really connected to the Tector News publication, um, which A, is a wonky policy commentator on all these issues, but B, has comments on its articles, in which case it is a platform and performing platform functions. and whether there's a First Amendment right to editorial discretion manifest in a platform really matters to that particular platform because that is very part and parcel with um, its business model. It's, it's media and expressive business model. Can it keep doing what it's doing? It depends if it has the First Amendment right to keep doing it. The second client was a man named Chris Riley um, who runs a Mastodon instance all by himself. He, I think it's tech policy, so, uh, I'm forgetting the URL, but I'm sorry? Techpolicy.social. Techpolicy.social. And he runs it himself. Um, and he runs it for his colleagues in the tech policy space who want an instance where, um, you know, to the extent that you're communicating within the instance, you're communicating about tech policy or at least your kindred spirits in the tech policy space. So other things you talk about will be consistent with his community of peers. And, you know, he's there to sort of illustrate how personal these types of editorial choices are because everyone's like, oh, well, the big companies, they're big companies, and they lose sight of what does it mean to be able to choose what expression you're associated with. But when we bring it down to an individual level, you know, that's a human being. And what do you mean that the state of Texas gets to tell Chris Riley sitting in California that he has to monitor, he has to run his platform for his community of peers the way Texas thinks that he should? Doesn't that seem ridiculous? Hopefully the court seems so. And then the third client was Blue Sky. Um, Blue Sky is producing another platform, but more than just the platform, they're producing a protocol. So it's not just that Blue Sky can run Blue Sky, but using the protocol that they're innovating, other people can also run their own platforms. So we're democratizing platform provision. We're democratizing in a way that it's not even little splinter net. But because of federation, they can still come together and talk to each other. And that basically, this is sort of the answer. We're not stuck with the big tech guys. Um, we, can, we can get something better. And a lot of these laws are really rooted in this fiction that Facebook is the internet. Facebook and maybe a couple other big colleagues are the internet. And if that were true, it would start to make more sense that state action could be <coughs> justified to say, you are so big and so ubiquitous and there's no other choice. Um, we really do need to force you to be open to more comers because otherwise people won't have a chance to speak. But that's not true. That's not the ecosystem that we're living in. But the more that laws like this exist, the more that will be the ecosystem that we're living in, in which case you're going to end up, this is all very self-defeating, because you're not going to get more speech online. You're going to end up with less. So um, that's both what brought me here and some thoughts from today. Great. So then we'll come back to the order we were in. And Rupa, you first, and then Scott. Great. Thank you. So uh, my name is Rupa Bhattacharya. I work for the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection at Georgetown Law Center. Our, we filed an amicus brief in this case on behalf of several, uh, a couple dozen national security experts and professionals because we wanted to make the point to the court that the social media companies though they're not perfect, play a really important role in keeping very, very extreme and violent and hateful content away from their users. And that that is something that's critical to the national security of the United States and critical to our democracy. Um, so that sounds like we made an argument about the need for the social media companies to exercise their editorial discretion. And, and, and we did. 
Um, but we filed on behalf of neither party, and we did so for a couple of reasons, several of which were actually touched on by the court, and so I wanted to just sort of focus on those. The first reason, which didn't come up in the argument today, is that my national security professionals that I represented really don't know very much about the First Amendment, and so we didn't feel terribly comfortable saying much about the First Amendment. But the more important reasons are, number one, the social media companies aren't terribly good at content moderation. You see things you don't want to see. They take things down that probably shouldn't get taken down. They leave things up that maybe should have gotten taken down. Um, and so we wanted to point out that they're not great, but they're better than nothing, and that's something. And what we're concerned about with these two laws is that by effectively prohibiting content moderation, not only does it not happen at all, but it also really disincentivizes them from getting better, um, and which is something that we would like certainly to see happen. The second reason that we filed on behalf of neither party, and several of the justices noted this point, is that there are real landmines here. There is a First Amendment right to expression, to editorial content management, to content moderation. We think that's true. But we also think that the social media companies aren't First Amendment monoliths. There are places here for a appropriate government regulation of what the social media companies do. Anti-discrimination laws, anti-fraud laws, consumer protection regulations. And we want to make sure, and you heard some of this from the Solicitor General, we want to make sure that if the court rules in this area, it does so in a way that preserves the ability of governments to do something thoughtful and useful, which the Texas and Florida laws are not. Great. Thank you. And then Scott. Thanks. Um, really great to be here. So um, w with everything having been said, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm a W, so I'm used to going last um, a lot. Um, I was in my last law school section, and I was a W, so I was like the fourth to last person to graduate. Anyway, um, so I want to just talk a, a, a little bit about uh, the merits very briefly, and then I want to talk about sort of appellate procedure here and civil procedure, because it's just so important in these cases, and it should underscore to all of the, the students here how important procedure is in the district court, but also um, on appeal. So on the merits, I think you know, we, have a, we have very similar positions because you know, we believe there's a, a strong, very important right to editorial judgment, but it's not absolute. And what you see with the two sides here are absolutist arguments on either side. You see the platform saying, we have a right to editorial judgment that really makes almost any regulation of them unconstitutional. It's a very strong position on that side. And then you have Texas and Florida saying the platforms have zero First Amendment rights and the government, the state governments, federal government can basically do what they want to regulate how the platforms moderate content. And we think both of those positions are, are just wrong. But um, I, I would say we, we are more supportive of the platforms because we agree that there is a strong right to editorial judgment and the platforms play a, a fundamentally important role in moderating content and curate, curating content to make these enormous forums for speech on the internet um, even understandable to us and make them even useful to us. I mean, if content moderation didn't happen at all, I'm not sure what we would do with all of the information um, that one could find on, on Facebook or the other platforms. So it, you know, it's an essential right. It's so important for free speech online, public discourse, and for our democracy. And, and that is clear. Um, we, we have no disagreement with the platforms on that. However, um, it is limited. There, are, there should be certain kinds of carefully drawn uh, regulations that survive First Amendment challenges. Uh, one big example here, which actually the, the, the two state laws contain provisions about this. Um, I'm gonna talk about transparency for a second. You know, it's really important for democracy to know what these platforms are doing under the hood. Yes, we can talk about the level of detail and you know, how much they would have to disclose and, and whether that trenches too closely on editorial judgment, but there could be a lot more uh, disclosure here than there currently is, and that would that would actually serve democracy. It would serve users to understand what the platforms are doing. So I think that you know there's uh, there's a strong First Amendment right of the platforms, but it is limited, 
and there's a role for government regulation in certain carefully drawn ways, um, not to the extent that Florida and Texas claim, uh, which is really which would just have terrible effects. I mean, so many kinds of speech that nobody wants to see, um, you know, which was mentioned many times to the justices, um, that would all of a sudden we would become, you know, flooded with. Um, you know, there, there are many uh, reasons to be concerned about those those two laws. But let me let me just turn to to an area that's not supposed to be my expertise. But let me quickly address the sort of appellate, uh, well, civil procedure to appellate procedure. So these cases actually, for the Supreme Court, as the today's made clear, they're a bit of a mess. And one of the critical roles of the Supreme Court law clerks, I don't want to call them out here, but is to figure out whether these cases are a quote unquote good vehicle. And which really I think here means can the court reach the merits and decide these cases on the merits? And what you saw today was a lot of concern among most of the justices that, gosh, are these really the right cases for us to reach the merits for a couple of reasons? I mean, there is this the facial challenge issue. Can the court really look at Twitter, uh, Facebook, YouTube specifically, or just is the court limited by the fact that this was brought as a facial challenge? They have to consider possible uh, legitimate applications and on, on that basis um, uh, dissolve the preliminary injunction, um, reject the, the suit that has been brought. But also there's the issue that this is a preliminary injunction. And typically, in preliminary injunction cases, there is either no discovery or very limited discovery. And you may have, as well as the case here, uh, briefs put in by the platforms, and they attach three or four or five short declarations from one from Facebook and one from the, the main, the main you know, three or four platforms. And that's all that's in the record. And the states don't really, didn't get to do much. And so there's, I mean, there literally is like a really short little book of the record here which the justices were very concerned about. So you have a case come up on a facial challenge and on a, a really you know, minimal record. And that's a thing to just, you know, which is, it's a bit of a mess now that these cases have made it to the Supreme Court and the court's trying to figure out what to do. And that's why the court asked each of the main advocates, what should we do? And they really, uh, um, the Solicitor General of the United States, um, uh, 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 Mrs. Prelogar, um, you know, was, was sort of giving them several different options. They're struggling with this. So I think at the end of the day here, they're going to issue a very narrow ruling. They, they may address the key question, which is the, the, the speech, the First Amendment rights of the, the kind of heartland platforms, you might say, that we're talking about Facebook, uh, um, Twitter, and YouTube. They, they may address that, the, um, the SG for the U.S., sort of suggested that or was in favor of that, but they might not even want to go there. I, I just, I, you know, they're concerned about the laws going into effect and what that would do uh, to these, uh, you know, key platforms. But I just think there's a lot of uncertainty. I would be, I would love to be in the room when the nine of them sit around their conference table and talk about what do we do, because I bet it's going to be a really interesting conversation. I, uh, that, that's all. I agree, and I want to pick up, uh, you stole a little bit of the thunder, but I want to, uh, for the law students, this is a really important um, point about the adversarial system, and, and that we don't have an inquisitorial system where the judge is sort of running the case. As lawyers, it's your case, and you're going to make decisions about how to litigate your case, and part of what the justices were frustrated with was the way the lawyers had presented this case to them, that the, they made choices about how they litigated and how quickly they accelerated it up to the court um, and, and without a record, um, and yet it is a facial challenge. So, so the net choice plaintiffs could have also made an as-applied challenge, uh, and they didn't, and that was a strategic choice that put the posture, put the justices in an uncomfortable posture. And there was almost this sort of playground back and forth between the lawyers. It's your fault. No, it's your fault uh, that we don't have a sufficient record because all of the justices expressed some level of discomfort, as Scott was just saying, because uh, as a facial challenge, you're saying there is no possible legitimate application of this law. You now have to imagine the universe. So I want to ask the panelists then to chime in first on that because 
it does seem like the m most pressing question that they're going to have to address at conference is, what do we do with these cases in the posture that they're in? And I, I just uh, take volunteers as this. Uh, Steve, go ahead. Um, just a couple of thoughts. Um, Scott's point, I think, is well taken that this isn't a great vehicle but given the way the two cases came out in the circuits, there was nothing they could do. There really was no option. Well, were, were they going to deny cert in the Texas case and let it, let that law stay in effect? I mean, I, this is the perfect storm, right? They, they didn't want this, but there was nothing they could do about it, I think. Um, uh, I don't think the law clerk screwed up in not screening these as appropriate vehicles. I just think there was nothing that could be done. They had to hear the cases. I think my view, and, and, and I don't know if others agree or disagree, is, you know, the reason these cases are coming up now and not sometime before this is exactly why we're here, that the, the justices knew how complicated this would be and how little they understood the complexity of these issues and how difficult it would be to sort them out. I mean, I think, you know, that's they haven't had exactly these opportunities but they've had other opportunities to think about whether to take internet related cases and we're glad they didn't because they would have made a mess of them and now they're gonna make a mess of them. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I kind of think that this is the court's fault. Um, there, one of the things, so the, uh, the Florida one sort of evolved the way cases are normally supposed to evolve. The law came out Net Choice filed its challenge. Um, district court enjoined it. Um, it went up on appeal to the 11th Circuit. The 11th Circuit largely supported the injunction, although it reversed on a couple of the provisions. And then, in theory, the next course of action is a cert petition from um, from uh, the party that lost, which in this case was Florida. If that was it, then the co then the justices would be in a position of looking at the cert petition and thinking whether the cert petition had enough merit that it, that Florida raised a point that they needed to weigh in on. Um, but the problem is that's not the way the whole case was. Because then meanwhile, um, Texas had done its law and that choice did the same thing to say, hang on a second, this is facially unconstitutional. They, they litigate for an injunction. I forget actually offhand whether they actually got it at the district court or not, but things go wrong in Texas and they go wrong quite badly um, because even whatever they got it at the district court didn't matter because next stop was the Fifth Circuit. And the Fifth Circuit has been playing games with appellate procedure and um, it's becoming a problem. So they had a staggered order that was separate from a decision and all of a sudden we need emergency relief or this law is going to go into effect and there was shadow docket litigation. I filed an amicus brief in the shadow docket litigation to basically say, hang on a second, um, you know, if this goes into effect, all of a sudden we're off to the races and whatever. If there is any chilling effect that this law is going to potentially wreak, it's going to wreak it now. So this got to, the Texas law got to the Supreme Court in a really roundabout way with all the shadow docket litigation and the court hates calling things the shadow docket, but they've let this happen. So now they had this big problem because you had this normal thing where you could have denied cert in Florida, but you have this abnormal thing that's coming out of the Fifth Circuit, which the Supreme Court keeps enabling. So yeah, great, we have a mess. And now they're blaming the litigants for it, but we're not getting what we need from the courts to be able to adjudicate things normally. And now they're sitting there at oral arguments saying, why didn't you adjudicate it normally? If I could just comment on that really, I mean, I actually don't think that the shadow docket really had anything to do with the grant of cert here. The grant of cert was based on the fact that you had a very significant circuit split between the 11th Circuit and the 5th Circuit on the merits, quite regardless of whether the whole issue with the shadow docket was about whether there should be a stay while the appeal is going up to the Supreme Court. I don't think that had anything to do with why cert was granted. But I think, you know, this goes back to the point about uh, you're the lawyer crafting your own case. And my criticism of the, of, of the law clerks and the kind of good vehicle thing is there were many different claims brought by NetChoice in the district court. And NetChoice chose to seek a preliminary injunction on the First Amendment claim and also Section 230, at least in, in Florida. 
And that was, that was a limited choice. Now, the Supreme Court law clerks could have said, look, why wasn't, for example, the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, addressed here? Which, you know, which, 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 you know, I think a big concern here is, well, how can you have a different regime in all 50 states? Florida and Texas have different laws. How can that be? Um, there are various ways that the court could have ordered briefing um, on other issues, including Section 230. Uh, Dormant Commerce Clause, there are ways that the clerks could have uh, cleaned up this case before it actually was argued before the court. And I just think, you know, I, I, however this, whoever's at fault, at least we have a mess. We have a mess. And the court is now going to have to deal with that mess. Well, first of all, the uh, pork producers' cases could make the Dormant Commerce Clause a lot more exciting and uh, close than you might think it is describing this on the surface. I don't know how much that's going to help them. You're a lawyer. You have to make decisions. You have a limited page number. You have limited judicial attention. I think you obviously go for the First Amendment. You strike for the jugular with these things. Um, maybe it doesn't work out, and that's that's too bad. You win some, you lose some. Some get rained out. But I will point out, um, <clears throat> the most important parts of this law are facially unconstitutional. Uh, what does it mean to uh, moderate content consistently? I, I don't know. The Solicitor General of Florida doesn't know. The people who passed this law, don't, they didn't think that through to pass the law. They passed the law because they hate the companies, and you know, passing it was the point. Um, so no amount of discovery is going to parse out that sloppy provision. I mean, at one point, the Texas Solicitor General, uh, he was asked by Justice Kavanaugh, you know, well, viewpoint neutrality. So uh, if we have like anti-terrorist speech or like news about terrorism, doesn't that mean you have to do like pro-terrorist speech? And the Solicitor General said, well, it depends on what category you put the pro-terrorist speech in. It's like, well, that's the whole point. That's everything on, on con you know, on uh, social media. Um, Viewpoint neutrality vis-a-vis -vis what? Uh, Pro-terrorist versus like news about terrorism or like anti-terrorism? Um, there's no answer to that. Texas doesn't actually know the answer to that. The people who passed the law don't know the answer. No, about, no amount of discovery is going to fix that. So I have a certain amount of sympathy for the people below who had their eye kind of on the North Star of the, the most unconstitutional parts of this law. And I have sympathy for the point that you can't save your sloppy, trashy law by just putting in other lard so that it's like a denial of service attack and the lawyer like can't get at every provision with enough attention and then you're like, your really unconstitutional thing uh, slips through because you added a cookie. Um, so we'll see what happens, but... Um, and Paul Clement made that argument that basically, I, I almost wish he had reiterated it more succinctly, but basically... The, the reason they were arguing about the standard Salerno was because otherwise you have this weird thing where you've got an awful lot that's really facially wrong with the law and you somehow redeemed it because you threw one aspect that may actually be legitimately applicable. And so that would mean that the Supreme Court can't allow the injunction so the whole garbage bill is go going to go into effect and you're going to have all the chilling effects because it was saved by one provision that wasn't actually garbage. Like th th he basically said that can't possibly be the way it works because you're going to have a huge chilling effect just on the back of this one legitimate provision. And certainly that's not something that the first amendment would tolerate. But can I ask, I mean, so justice Jackson's response seems to be, well, then why didn't you put an as supply challenge in? Like if, if it, you know, it, it, because the facial, you're asking us to make a very broad judgment on with without having a uh, briefing on all the possible applications to Etsy and Uber and and, and that. So so I guess uh, my guess is that and I'm the total speculative guess is that um you leave yourself a lot more open to sort of failing on a motion to dismiss and getting yourself open to a lot more discovery because the argument is much stronger on the other side to say, um, great, as applied, let's investigate you and really like poke and prod at you and see how you operate and see how the law operates to you. Um, and that they probably made a strategic choice that they wanted to try to take this out, thing out root and branch. And I would certainly say that ex ante looking at it before you file your complaint um, with the information available at hand, I, 
litigator here clearly sticking like uh, that seems like a defensible decision. No, I that's I, I think that's exactly right. I, I worked on some of these cases when I was at the Justice Department, and I know that if if they had made an as applied challenge here on a case like this, where what they were claiming was editorial discretion, we would have served every bit of discovery in the book about what are your content moderation policies, how do you make decisions, who writes your code, what does the code say, and the social media companies don't want to get into those sorts of details. We know they don't, um, and that would have been the risk of filing an as applied. You shouldn't have to. That's an incredible burden that the First Amendment is supposed to shield you from. And let's, you know, let's go back to the history where I'm actually surprised this didn't come up today. The Florida law was also the bill that had the theme park exemption. Because for a while when uh, Governor DeSantis was not mad at Disney, Disney had the political leverage to say, by the way, this is going to be really bad for us, so make sure we're were not reached by this law. So this was obviously a garbage law where Governor DeSantis really wanted to control the editorial discretion of the platforms because he didn't like the way they had exercised it. There was nothing hidden about it, and that choice's argument is like, this is very simple. A state actor is trying to control what speech exists online, and game over, First Amendment says no. So at that point, I think the litigation strategy is if you don't say I'm calling, I'm throwing a flag on that. Um, a, you obfuscate the wrongness of, of the position, but then you also burden yourself where you've got to go get injured in order to get uninjured. And I think they're like, that's not the way this, this is supposed to work. So that's why the litigation looks the way it does. One other quick back point, though. Um, I think in the Florida thing with um, 230, I think, was a defense that was actually sort of brought up. But I think the court, or particularly by the time it reached the 11th Circuit, I think the 11th Circuit is the one who short-circuited the That's 230 right. by saying, we don't need to reach it because First Amendment throws this out. District judge covered, yeah. yeah. Um, so... That's not necessarily the litigant's choice. That was the way that, in theory, if this got remanded um, and you, you're really evaluating the merits, it could get thrown out on a number of bases, constitutional and statutory. But on the injunction level, the, the 11th Circuit was like, First Amendment, we're done. Can I, can I ask, a, so uh, sort of focusing on what we did hear from the justices, one, one was it did seem like they were dividing the universe of potentially of the regulated parties so that they had sort of in mind a, a core group of platforms, the YouTube, Facebook, uh, and, and regardless of who the justice was, um, when that became the topic, they were like, yeah, yeah, I get, I get that there's a problem there, but Etsy, but Uber. So what do they do? I, I guess, do you share the sense that there was a broad sense of agreement that these laws are likely unconstitutional as applied to the content moderation on YouTube and and uh, it, like that's uh, and I wish Justice Kagan had asked her question a little differently about how many content mo I mean how many content moderators does Verizon employ in its in the provision of cell phone service like to me that would be the way to distinguish common carriers from if you've read Kate Klonick's great Harvard Law Review article that explains the tiers of content moderation at Facebook, it's it's thousands of employees uh, engaged in this activity. So anyway, I, I, to have the justices not sort of appreciate how complex the content moderation apparatus is uh, was, was striking, but it, maybe they did appreciate it and they were like, yeah, yeah, I get that. But so reactions? Well, first of all, I have skepticism about the getting it when Justice Alito is saying that content moderation is just an Orwellian term for censorship. Uh, can I just make a quick point about email to that? Because uh, Paul Clement kind of wandered into direct messages, and I, I think he probably regretted it. Um, just two quick points on that. Number one, uh, it's not as obvious as you might think that email, well, that clearly should be like a common carrier type thing. Um, most of the law students in here are probably not that much younger than me, and yet I probably am old enough to tell you about how when I was a kid at dinner time, we had a landline telephone, right? And it would like ring always at dinner because that's when the solicitors would call. It's like, that was annoying, but it was like one time every other night or whatever. Um, I think people aren't necessarily aware of how much goes into their spam folders in email and how much content moderation of email now occurs today. 
Um, so I would say all things equal, maybe Clement should have gotten off email a lot faster, but also like, don't just assume that email, oh, well, that's just like the telephone. Uh, it occurred to me actually, just as I was sitting here, you know, we get these records, HB 20 has a non-discrimination provision about email buried in it and nobody challenged it. That law is in effect right now. Um, so it's interesting that Paul Clement uh, stuck to his guns that hard. I, I wonder if one of his associates flagged that for him like when they were prepping for the oral argument. That is sitting around like a loaded gun, just a preview for you all. I'd be very interested if that suddenly pops up now. Um, didn't come up with the argument, so I don't know, maybe it's just like nobody's noticed that and I've screwed up now because now they're gonna start enforcing it. Because you, you know, like Texas politicians are totally watching this video, but anyway. <laughs> Maybe I can just mention Section 230, but in a different context. I think maybe folks here are familiar with the Gonzalez case, which was argued last year. And there the court was extremely worried about how it might screw up the Internet, to, to put it um, bluntly. And Justice Kagan famously said, you know, we're not the nine experts on the Internet. And I think some of that is, is at work here, too, with how the court is approaching uh, these cases and how it might try to not get rid of them entirely, but uh, you know, send as much of it back as they can or just find a way to, to really issue a narrow ruling. I do think if they take on uh, how those laws apply to Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, that, I, I mean, it seemed to me that there were a, a, quite a few justices really concerned about the First Amendment implications uh, of those laws and, and, and that there is expressive Con, uh, express, there are expressive acts happening here when platforms moderate content. That is First Amendment protected material. It seemed to me like a very strong view. But the, well, you know, the worry here is, you know, will they get there given the, the posture of the case? And some of them ask, like, can we, could we even do it under the, our facial challenge jurisprudence? And so, you know, while I hope that they will get there, and I do think that, that there very well could be, um, you know, a ruling in favor of the platforms, hopefully not um, as far as they would like the ruling to go, but in a more, a more much more limited way, uh, you know, it, they may not feel like they can do it at this time. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm glad you brought up the Gonzalez and the, and the Twitter cases. We filed an amicus brief there, too, and I think you see the same problem there that you see here, um, which is the justices are struggling for an analogy. They're struggling for something that looks like the real world. And the problem is, is that the Internet doesn't look like the real world. There are far more actors. There are far more... Um, there are far more places where automatic features are coming into play. There are far more things where the social media companies don't look at every single thing that goes up on their websites. They can't possibly look at every single thing that goes up on their websites. And so the analogies don't work. And they're struggling to find the right model for looking at these cases. And what happened in Gonzales and what happened in Twitter is probably what's going to happen here. They punted. Well, I, I don't know that they can totally punt. And I, I, so, I mean, I, I think the, con I spent a good chunk of the afternoon thinking to myself, well, is there a punt? And I don't think there is. I mean, the, 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 the Fifth Circuit upheld the, the Texas law. Um, the internet cannot, although the Texas Solicitor General, uh, who I've known for a very long time, uh, made a, a gallant effort to suggest that one could hermetically seal Texas off uh, from the rest of the country. There are many in Texas who probably would like to do that, um, but that's not, you cannot do that. Uh, and so, uh, and th so the internet is connected uh, and, and you cannot, and you simply cannot leave uh, the, this, this Texas law in place and you simply cannot leave the Fifth Circuit's decision uh, in place. Uh, and so I think what I suspect will happen at the end of the day, uh, because that is, I, I, I think that there is a, I think there will be a recognition of that, uh, that, uh, something has to, to be done, uh, and 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 the but but the impulse towards caution, which is I think actually an admirable one. I think it's what led the court to um, uh, uh, to, to to kick the Gonzalez uh, case and not uh, break the internet by waiting uh, haphazardly uh, into Section two thirty. Uh, I think the the court will again uh, both want to not break the internet. 
uh, by leaving uh, these laws in place, but also will not want to um, uh, bite off more than they need to chew uh, by deciding a bunch of questions uh, that uh, don't need to be decided. So I, I think they will they will find a way. They're very very good at that. Uh, and uh, and I and, and you know it, it may not be wholly satisfying the, the answer that 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 General Prelogger provided that 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 one should apply the party presentation principle here. At the same time, I'm not sure that a facial challenge should fail when the parties defending the law have not identified a constitutional application until Justice Alito thinks of one uh, at oral argument. And, and, and so I think there is a, there is a, there is a principle uh, of how cases develop that one could apply here that says, you know, the burden to come forward with a good facial argument is on the plaintiff, and they have to come forward and they have to make a, a fair argument for why there are no or basically no constitutional applications of the law. At that point, the state defending a law has the burden now to rebut that. And they have to rebut it, they have to point something out about why the law can be constitutionally applied. And if they do, then that can be worked out in the district court before it gets to the Supreme Court. But if they don't, then you don't get to, at the Supreme Court stage, come up with some hypothetical that no one thought of up until that point. And that's not a, it's not a bad way to run a railroad, uh, so to speak, to, to make uh, the parties actually litigate the case in the district court rather than uh, at the lectern in the, in the Supreme Court. You're absolutely right. I amend my prior thought. They're not going to punt forever, but I do think they're going to punt for now and send it back for more record development. So I'm going to ask. So what are they going to do? They're going to let the Texas law no, go into effect. No, they're going to keep the injunction in place to not because they can't let the Texas law go into effect. You're right about that. Um, but uh, but they'll send it back. I think from they were arguing about that as part of the argument. Like if we remand, what are we remanding for? Yeah. Yeah. What do we want them to do on remand? I mean, I'm sort of agnostic about a. Remand. I mean, and I think even um, Net Choice was kind of like, look, it was an injunction. We were fully expecting to eventually litigate on the merits. But I think to go back to the court with some sort of assertion by this court of say, by the way, the platforms do have a First Amendment right. So therefore, everything that follows has to be evaluated in the context of this now acknowledged right, which at the moment has only been you know, argued by net choice, but it would be nice if the Supreme Court could sort of say, that's not a garbage theory. Now take that, this is the rules of the road, and now go look at this mess and see if it passes constitutional muster. That is useful, and that will keep the litigation going in a way where it's not unduly burdensome. It'll probably, it'll meet the injunction standards, so it'll stay enjoined. And if there's anything redeeming, you know, Florida and Texas will be able to save the redeeming part of their law. Um, but I'm afraid, like, if the court does not do that, then we're just stuck in this morass. And it's coming up in other contexts. Because, like, next month, we'll all be here talking about Murphy versus Missouri, where we've completely missed the fact that the platforms... So the injunction doesn't bind the platforms. The injunction just says the government can't talk to the platforms. But doesn't that affect the platforms? Like, if the platforms have rights, isn't that injunction impacting the rights of the platforms, but we have nothing from the Supreme Court announcing that platforms do in fact have their own First Amendment rights which need to be considered. And it would be awfully helpful in the context of these new things if we had that on the books. Because then all of a sudden now we can litigate the internet more effectively because we've got this North Star and then we look at how everything else that we need to regulate and may want to regulate can be regulated consistent with the Constitution. Because right now, it's, you know, it, it's a blank chessboard, and this is not working. So, I wonder. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to turn to the audience in a minute for questions. So I'm going to let the panelists sort of finish this intra-panel discussion, which is very interesting. But I, we are going to leave a little bit of time for Q&A. So get your questions ready, and go ahead, Rupert. Oh, I was just going to say, I, this conversation has, has made me think that uh, it, it's, it seems possible that there will be a plurality opinion and no majority opinion, and they'll, they'll be able to sort of effectively reverse the Fifth Circuit's decision and keep and have the sort of outcomes that they're looking for without any kind of reasoning that anyone can latch onto. And then maybe we'll be here uh, after there's been some kind of <laughs> deep fleshing out on the merits in, in two years or I whatever. I think not if Kavanaugh has anything to say about it, because Kavanaugh was all over the 
yeah, they've got First Amendment rights. Censorship only counts when it's by the government. Yeah. And so he seems to feel very strongly about it. And I wonder to what extent he will drive the decision and maybe even write it. It did seem like Kavanaugh is sort of the, the swing on this one. I mean, Roberts and Kavanaugh are right in the center. But any sort of last things that the justices said that really struck you one way or the other, uh, and some of it might be about how this case gets resolved, some of it might be more how they understand or don't the internet uh, or the applicable laws. You mentioned uh, Justice Gorsuch's reading of Section 230, which was uh, in my world, you know, quite upside down, saying, well, doesn't Section 230 make websites into uh, like common carriers when it's like precisely the opposite? It protects any uh, user, provider, or user of an interactive computer service. So, mind you, it protects you on your. Twitter account and what you retweet. So if you hold that Section 230 makes someone protected by it, a common carrier, you're a common carrier. The government can tell you what you have to retweet. Um, that should give you a sense of how like wild that theory is. And what really struck me, um, going to Ari's point about running a railroad, I am going to blow a gasket if after Gonzalez versus Google and all of that careful briefing um, and sending them a case that's like teed up and as as you've got all the material, we're all, we're all explaining to you how Section 230 works, and they like punt. And then we have a totally different case, and they're like, let's do a revolutionary Section 230 case now. Um, that is not how you run a railroad. I mean, talking about what justices say, did we allude to the um, how much would YouTube weigh? <laughs> um, yeah. At some point, Justice Alito uh, posed the question, I mean, if, if you're... Let's say YouTube were a newspaper. How much would it weigh? <laughs> anyway, he'll be voting on this decision one way or the other. <laughs> Ari Cohn asked ChatGPT, and it came up with like 420,000 pounds. I don't know. <laughs> the internet is a series of tubes. Other, other things that you heard that popped out? No? It, no, go ahead. Well, I just, it, you know, it's... it's it's a very unusual combination of such a difficult uh, sort of watershed potential First Amendment case combined with an, really, an also really unusual um, sort of procedural morass that we now have. You don't really see the kind of um, at sea, we don't, like how can we deal with this case from the Supreme Court? Uh, that happens very rarely. And unfortunately, it happens to have happened in a case that has such enormous importance for the future of uh, of online public discourse. Um, you know, in the in the, that, that serves our democracy so fundamentally. So, this is just a very. Uh, I don't think any of us up here thought that we would be speaking to you in the, under these circumstances, where so much of the argument was questions about how do we even decide, how can we decide this case. Yeah, the, the, the only other observation, which we've, a few people have, have mentioned that, that I thought was very interesting, is that this, the, 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 the advocates spend an unusual amount of time arguing other cases uh, rather than only this case. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that a, a good, a really healthy portion of argument was spent on, on the meaning of Section 230, and it, which, is a, which is a fair question because the Florida law has an exclusion that the law doesn't apply insofar as Section 230 protects the, the platforms. And so it's it, technically in the case, but, but there was a really a healthy portion of the argument that was devoted to what the meaning of Section 230 is, which is in some ways is the Gonzalez case being argued now. And, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a piece, a small piece, but a piece of the argument was about the Murthy case, which is the, the job owning case that's coming up uh, uh, later this term. Uh, and I think what that reflects is that we are we are at a pivotal moment in the law uh, of the internet, which is that even though um, the internet's been around for a long time, or as as Justice Thomas put it, it's been around the basically the length of his tenure uh, on the on the court. Um, it's there've been not that many internet decisions uh, by the Supreme Court, and they're now all. Uh, coming to the court at once. Uh, last term, 
uh, and it, with, with the with the Tamna and the and the Gonzalez uh, cases this term uh, with the ones I just mentioned and the and the case about uh, 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 whether users of, of, a, of a platform become state actors who if they're government officials and they and they and they moderate uh, or they block uh, uh, users of the of, of their platform so um, I, I do I I do think the court's gonna issue a decision in this case um, I think it's going to issue a decision in the other cases and and I and I think uh, we are going to see one way or another, um, you know, a, a, a huge amount of law uh, be made uh, that is going to shape how we think about uh, the law on, online. I agree. And as someone who's been teaching cyber law since 2001, uh, you know, I'd, I'd throw in the Van Buren case. We'd been waiting for the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to get to the court for years. So it really does feel like a maturation in, a, in, in a lot of different areas where the Internet is now central. Um, and so I, I would agree with you. But Paul, did you have a, you got, you want the first question? Two observations, uh, both on the argument and on uh, what y'all have been talking about. It's difficult for me to think that the slinging around the word censorship was anything more than political rhetoric uh, by justices who wanted to get the platforms to admit that they engage in censorship not for any legal reason, but for uh, ideological uh, animus reasons. Uh, and I just don't think that most of the justices are going to play along with that. You might see that in concurring and dissenting opinions. Uh, but uh, I thought, in particular, Alito was embarrassing, intellectually embarrassing in many of his questions. It seemed like he started to ask questions that went along ideological lines and then realized how stupid he sounded and then backed away. Um, uh, the second thing is... Don't you want a list of internet locations? <laughs> uh, so the second thing, uh, comment, overall comment I have, is that um, in Gonzales, wised up to how complicated all this is. And what you saw in that case was a recognition that they could really screw things up. And I just hope that that recognition continues into this case. And that although there are some real complexities about the way you think about facial challenges and the standards for making facial challenges and who gets to raise and has to raise what, Maybe this is an argument for dishonesty in judicial opinions. Um, you know, making a simple decision which throws out the Texas case and sustains the Florida case and makes as much effort as possible not to screw up the law on what it takes to do a step facial step challenge and whose burden it is. I think even if Net Choice gets the win that it wants, it's going to get a win where the court will try to have the smallest impact. The problem is, I think that's what they want, but when they don't understand fully, it <coughs> tends to be not what they get. That in trying to be small, they end up knocking over all the dominoes directly. So we really have to see how they rank this thing. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, just one thing I would say is, you know, in some sense, Gonzalez and this case are, are about the same thing. And, you know, I think the fear in Gonzalez, the issue in Gonzalez was, you know, whether algorithmic recommendations fall within Section 230's immunity. And there we submitted an amicus brief and argued, you know, how essential algorithmic recommendations are to the function of the Internet as a whole. For us to be able to make sense of the billions and maybe trillions of pieces of information, it's essential that social, that, social, that Internet platforms, writ large, but also social media platforms, can use algorithms of, of various kinds, but algorithmic recommendations are fundamental to the way that we consume information online. And similarly, in this case, and I'm, I can't remember which justice, it might be Justice Kagan, but, you know, in this case, too, or actually, it must, yeah, I'm trying to remember, but in this case, too, uh, sort of algorithmic recommendations are at issue because they, they are what plays a fundamental role in content moderation, what the platform wants to uh, emphasize to users and not emphasize, and you know, I think that 
um, you know, so, and I think the court is going to be concerned here for this, a similar reason. They don't want to say that there are no First Amendment rights of the platforms to help us make sense of the information on the platforms. Uh, you know, I think they see that, uh, at least several justices do. And so some of the concerns in Gonzalez are also going to be concerns here. Um, it's just it's just a matter of sort of how the internet works, how we make sense of the information that are at play in, in, in both cases. That said, I agree that they can't just get rid of this these net choice cases like, like they did Gonzalez. They don't have a full out. And so that's what's so fascinating from a matter of, of, of appellate procedure is what, what will they do? Thanks. So unlike the court, which let oral argument just go and they didn't feed their guests, we're going to feed our guests and we're, going to, we're at time. Um, I will say to the students in cyber law, you're here watching. I mean, I think you've heard from the panelists that this is cyber law in the making. Uh, and I'll be teaching whatever they come up with next year, next spring, um, because that's how this goes. Uh, but this this is a pretty big moment. Like, even if they decide to, to rule narrowly, for them to take this on at this point and in this posture, uh, it will have downstream ramifications, no matter how they try to, to cabinet. And uh, so we'll, we'll just have to see. And you as lawyers may be the ones who start to figure out how to tease out what those ramifications are. With that, let me ask us all to thank our distinguished panelists for their many talks and all their attention to four hours of oral argument to prepare <laughs> in addition to their briefing. I'm not counting how long time was spent waiting to get in. Yeah, of course. I was the first person in line for the bar and I got there, it was stupid, 5.30 in the morning. I could have gotten there. You came at 6.30. I came at 6.30. So I could have gotten there much later. I did a lot of Scott today. Huh. Okay, so we do have a reception for those who are in the room. For those online, I'm afraid, you know, we, can, we have no virtual food for you. Supreme Court argument that your brief is going to be really packed. Is somebody to sponsor for admission on that morning? Yeah, but it's too late. I'm already in All right, well, we're officially done. Let's get on, all right?